Hello, I'm Barbara Peters. Welcome to this episode of The Criminal Calendar. This is a really special treat for me because we have a long history with Sue Grafton. Hi, Sue. Hi, how are you? I can say that because Sue came to the store in 1990, just a few months after we opened. You were our first celebrity well, I'm author. excited to hear that. Do you remember that little cramp store? Yes, I do. And the person who stood and leaned on the refrigerator and stared at you for three and a half <laughs> hours? That was my first version of a celebrity the stalker. stalker. Uh. But you were, you were cool throughout. Yeah. Usually I'm so involved in what I'm doing that I don't even look up, as you know. You are so good to your fans. And you know, you have one of the great author signatures. It's a oh. short name. You write it clearly. I've watched author signatures devolve oh. for years. Well, I make a point. I'm kind of prissy at heart, so I travel with my calligraphy pens, 15 dozen pens. And I usually go through a dozen per signing, if not slightly more than that. So I sign, and when the signature ceases to be crisp or the pen gets too soft, I toss it aside, you know? That's, that's how I do it. Well, it's not possible to date your books by signature. We have um, observed with other authors mm -hmm. that over time you can kind of, you know, well, if they sign I'm, an older book later, exactly. the signature is so totally different. I mean, it's I, a small point. I've seen earlier signatures of mine. I don't know when I started using the calligraphy pens, but early on I did not. And it's so shocking to see it. It's like, ballpoint pen? What are we doing here? You know? Well, maybe oh, well. back in 1982. In fact, we were just having a discussion about when A is for Alibi actually yeah. published. Yeah. Yes, that was May of 1982. And how long was that book in the writing? Five years. Wow. I started, I believe, in 1977. Now, my math is terrible, somewhere around in there. And what I was doing was teaching myself how to write a private eye novel, mystery novel. I'd never done one, so I was reading every how-to book I could find. I was teaching myself private eye procedure, police procedure, ballistics, toxicology, California criminal law, which I'm always going back to review. And that, I think, is why it took me so long to put that book together. Why did you want to do a private eye novel as opposed to any other form of fiction? I, it, when, as I analyzed it, there were three categories of mystery novel. There was the amateur sleuth, the police procedural, and the private eye, which I had always admired being a fan of Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and Ross MacDonald. Uh, my father had written three mystery novels and published those in his lifetime. Uh, his true career was as a municipal bond attorney, but he loved, he loved hard-boiled private eye. He did, and the rat began to gnaw the rope, as you and I have discussed, remains one of my favorite mysteries. Thank you, mine too. I go back and read it periodically. And I do, I've, I can't remember the details of the rat began to gnaw the rope, or the, I, that one I remember, the rope began to hang the butcher. I have part of a third manuscript that he never finished. Really? Yeah. Have you ever thought about doing that yourself? No, <laughs> because <laughs> I, don't, I never understood how his mind worked. He's a very clever man. And as it came to pass, A is for Alibi was published four months after he died. Oh, no. So we never had a chance to sit down. I wish now I had understood his process. I just don't know how he worked. Had I known that, I might, in fact, be able to go back and piece together his intention. However, my true feeling is that we each have our work to do in this world. None of us know how long we have, and my job is to take care of my work. You know, he did what he could, and his process was interrupted, but that's how it goes. Well, but he was also not writing full-time. He was that's active right. in his profession yeah, as a lawyer. Yeah, he could not make a living at it. Just couldn't do it. When were, when were those books written and published? I've kind of forgotten. Uh, the Rad began to... Gnaw the Rope was published in 1943 and won the Mary Roberts Reinhardt Award of that year. And I think The Rope Began to Hang the Butcher must have been published a year or two after that. His last book, which is called Beyond a Reasonable Doubt, I believe was published in about 1950. Okay, so it was the time when it was wartime and there were a lot of distractions yes. going on and um, I think it was very difficult to make a living yes, as a writer. Exactly. And he, he was always in Louisville. Yes. I've learned to say Louisville from Louisville, you. Louisville, Louisville. You're doing pretty good. Well, at least I'm not saying Louisville. I know. I'm proud of you. So you grew up then with, with some idea of what it, what it is to yes. be a writer. But you went on to Hollywood. I mean, weren't you working in the movies when yeah, all well, you started Well, I started writing? as a solo writer. I started doing what we call mainstream fiction, okay. which is 
in my opinion, just sort of a loosely structured novel with no good homicide in it. But I did uh, my first novel when I was 22 years old. And that is that the one with the girl's name? I forgot. No, that, that, I'll get to that one. That's oh, okay. down the pike. All right. The first one was called Maggie, never published. The second novel I wrote was called, uh, I believe, The Monkey Room. <laughs> which is about a guy who worked in the monkey lab at, at Fort Knox. I had been married, to, was married to a fellow who did that, and so that was my research, just listening to stories from him. And then the third was called Sparrow Field, which is about a man in Kentucky who owns a garbage dump. See, I, you can probably guess why I was not breaking through <laughs> with these books. Regional, we'd call yes. those, right? The fourth novel was called Kaziah Dane. That's it. And that's the one you're thinking of. That was published by... Peter Owen Limited in England in 1967 or thereabouts, and Macmillan here in this country, 67. Then I wrote The M Lolly Madonna War. Ah, that's okay. Yeah, and and that was the one that sort of got you on the map, right? That got me to Hollywood to my everlasting regret. No, I have to, I'll tell you that story in a minute. The seventh, sixth novel I wrote was called The End of All Morning, I believe. There was a seventh, six and seven were never published, and the eighth book I wrote was A is for Alibi. So by then I had figured out that mystery novel was something I wanted to try, and that's when I launched myself into A is for Alibi. Is it because there's a strong plot, a sort of a spine for the story? It just interests me. I think it is the most intricate form, except for the sonnet. I always correct for that. The sonnet is tougher to do a good sonnet. The mystery form is exotic. It's it depends on structure and sleight of hand and masterful structuring and plotting all those elements. Often when I talk to writers getting into the business, I say to them, don't start with the mystery. That is the neurosurgery of literature. Start with something you can manage and teach yourself how to plot, how to do character, how to lay out a story, and then if you get good enough, you can tackle the mystery. The Lolly Madonna Wars, why did that get you to Hollywood? It was essentially the Hatfields and McCoy. I don't know why it worked. A British producer bought the film rights and came to this country, taught me to write screenplay form in about 10 days flat. We went to Hollywood. I had left my second husband by then, don't tell. <laughs> okay. And uh, so we, somehow that got launched. And it was a fabulous cast. Uh, Rod Steiger, Robert Ryan, Jeff Bridges. It was amazing, but it was not a good movie. In the end, it, and I understand now why it didn't work. Fourteen characters. You just can't do that. Oh, okay. It was too diffuse then? Yes, okay. it was too complex. There was no way on camera to handle all that. So in the end, it, it just did not work. But I learned a lot from that, and that's how I ended up working in Hollywood for 15 years. And what did you do? I wrote movies for television. I wrote TV pilots. I did... Uh, Episodes of Rhoda early on, that was, that was hard work. Uh, eventually, uh, Steve Humphrey and I started working together. He's my now and forever husband. Right. Uh, he has a degree in philosophy of physics, so once he got out of graduate school, I said, you are now fully qualified to work in Hollywood. So in Hollywood, you need somebody to walk, watch your backside. Mm -hmm. So we worked together for about eight years, and again, doing... We did the pilot, I'm so embarrassed to say this, for Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, the remake that they, I think it ran on CBS, 1982, I think I avoided it because I really liked the original. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But now I must correct my bad mouthing of Hollywood. In Hollywood, I learned how to structure right. a story. I learned how to write dialogue. I learned how to get into a scene and out of it and I learned how to do action. And all of that is essential to writing a mystery novel. 